I'm Marty Krause, curator of prints, drawings, and photographs, and my partner here is Harriet Warkle, curator of American art. This is an exhibition that's uh, built around essentially two of our great paintings, two paintings by Edward Hopper. Um, so, you know, why don't you tell us how you conceived of this exhibition and, and why you put it together in the way you did? Well, it all started, um, I think, about three or four years ago when the Whitney asked to borrow our hotel lobby for an exhibition they were having. And we thought that maybe in return it would be nice if we could borrow the sketches and put on a show of our own. It was going to be limited and it wasn't going to be um, too much involved. However, while we were developing it, we decided that maybe it would be nice to do a catalog for the show. Why do you think, I mean, it, it's sort of fascinating to me, but there are a very small number of American artists outside of contemporary artists who are really known in Europe and elsewhere in the world, but there always seems to be Hopper exhibitions going on internationally. I mean, what is it about Hopper that makes him so quintessentially American that, that people sort of associate him with American painting? I, I, I think it's, besides that, I think that Hopper, even though his work was created in a different period, is relevant today. His work uh, strikes a chord with people who look at it. And it seems enigmatic. It seems to force you to, to look at it and say, I have to figure out what's going on here. So the way I look at it is that they do all these exhibitions is because people are still trying to find out who is Hopper and why did he paint this and what does it mean? And so with every new generation that comes along, someone has something more to add to it. And now it's become very interesting to the Europeans because you know, they've, become, they've become a lot more interested in displaying American art. But Hopper, because if you want to display American art, what's more American than Hopper? What's more American than depicting the mundane things that people do every day? I mean, who, who bothers with that? I mean, there's landscapes, there's um, seascapes, uh, there's scenes, but this is just everyday things like a cafeteria, like a hotel lobby, uh, an office. I don't think too many people find that as interesting subjects like Hopper did. Well, it's, it's interesting that he would, I think, be so embraced because he was really working against the trend in art. I mean, he was working in a very sort of 19th century tradition uh, using a battery of drawings to uh, sort of underpin his painting before he went to work, whereas art in general was moving sort of through impressionism to abstraction to abstract expressionism uh, where there'd be sort of no underpinning uh, at all. There were no drawings whatsoever. And, and, and yet he's, there's something modern about him. Maybe it has to do with the subject matter more than the way he painted it. Or maybe there's a certain angst in his work. I mean, all of his things seem so lonely uh, and so sort of alienated in a way. The, the people in his, his painting seem sort of disassociated. They don't seem to really be interacting with one another. And uh, uh, so it's really fascinating. I mean, it really has a lot more to do with photography in a way. Uh, if you look at the photography in the 1930s, uh, than what was happening among the painters. And it, it's almost two stills, like film stills, like freezing people in, in, in certain positions and, and creating a scene that, that means a lot to him. I think that that's the thing about Hopper is that, you know, when you're looking for meaning in his paintings, you're probably not going to find it because Hopper was looking for meaning in himself. If the painting did not reflect something inside of him, then it wasn't it wasn't worthy of continuing. It wasn't worth pursuing. So I look at the sketches as maybe developing from something he actually saw, from something he, ske he sketched while he was on the L train or walking down the streets of New York or looking in the windows of a place or actually walking in a hotel lobby. So he would maybe make the first sketch just what he saw. Then he'd look at it and think to himself, 
how do I make this express me? How, I, how do I put my image of life and my personal experiences into this painting? So if you look at the sketches, which there are 10 of them, and you see how they progress, they really, really start moving around. He starts changing things little by little. It's not big. And even when he gets to the very, very last sketch, it doesn't look like the finished painting. It's close. But if you look at it, it has a lot of changes in it. And these are all the known drawings for that painting, yes, correct? Yes, they are. Right, right, they are. Well, it's really, and I'm, I'm assuming that the drawings and the painting has, have never been together outside of in Hopper's studio until we purchased the work. Well, the, they were together once, and that was in the show that the Whitney had asked uh. for it for. And they had done an exhibition of, I don't know, maybe um, 20 or 30 of Hopper's paintings, some of which they included the drawings, at least the ones that they, they had in their the collection. Did they have all the drawings that we have here? Uh, with the painting at that point, or they displayed a all they displayed all but one, uh -huh. but not I must say in the order in which I think they were created because there was no intention, I think, from for the Whitney to try to create an order to those drawings. Hopper didn't leave one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You have to look at them and think, how, where did he go, and how is it progressing, and how is it getting closer to the final image and then I think that I have a pretty good idea that what I have is correct there may be two of them that you could switch but for the most part I don't think they could go any other way so in general what is the progress I mean you talked about sort of going from a, a, a sketch of maybe actuality to the finished composition but but what is the general movement of the drawings I mean how, from where he starts to where he ends up, what is the major difference? Well, certainly the composition is completely different. Where you start with a, um, a sort of elongated hotel lobby, you're winding up with a, with a square hotel lobby with many more people in it. In fact, this is probably one of his more crowded paintings. And, you know, there's even a hi hidden... All four people. Aren't there four? There's three <laughs> and one not too obvious person. That's right, because Hopper usually didn't put very many people in his work. Now, he did have the sea, you know, sea watchers um, and, pe and things like that. But um, I, I think that Hopper's final depiction, and, and if you look at, look at how they progress, you'll see that there is communication all along the way. Even the final one, the older couple is communicating. And in the final one, there's a man sitting in the chair on the right-hand side. And there is no fourth person behind the desk. So you think, look at how much Hopper still had to think out once he got to his canvas. We have the couple no longer speaking to each other. And we have a girl, a very um, sensual-looking girl, sitting in that chair, replaced replacing the man, and you have this strange figure behind the desk. Now, the woman seated in the chair is essentially Joe. It's his wife. Is that All correct? All the images that Hopper creates of women start with images of his wife, because Joe was the only one that she allowed her husband to use as a model. We think that's reflected in the sensuality of the figure that he's depicted. Because not being able to use any other model, he has to change his wife into somebody more desirable. And even the older woman is wearing Joe's fur coat, right? Joe's fur coat is an interesting story. The Hoppers were very frugal. And far be it from them to spend money on something they really didn't need. They bought used cars and they uh, ate at cheap restaurants and... When she was cooking at home, she opened a can of beans, but that's probably because she couldn't cook. But one day, Hopper decided that he would buy his, his wife a fur coat. Well, Joe was livid and did not speak to Hopper for six months. Of course, that was something that Hopper really relished and thought about over the years, about how she didn't speak to him for six months. Um, I'm assuming that, because I, I'm assuming from the relationship I know they had. But... The one thing she did do, she wore that fur coat 
even though she disliked the fact that Hopper bought it, to every one of Hopper's openings, you know, when they showed his paintings, and she wore it when she could in the paintings themselves. So she couldn't have been that unhappy with it. Well, we've talked about the one painting, Hotel Lobby, uh, but we actually had another painting in the collection far earlier. I think we bought it from him, uh, entitled uh, New York, New Haven, and Hartford. Uh, and that's the name of a railroad that sort of goes from New York City up uh, into Massachusetts, which doesn't make any sense since Hartford is in Connecticut. You'd think that would be the end of the line, but it's not. Uh, and we've, you've paired that with some other paintings that were done, not necessarily at the same moment that our painting was, but along that same railroad line. Is that correct? Yes, I did. And, you know, it's funny. People ask me the question as to why did you put New York, New Haven, and Hartford with Truro paintings? It's not obvious, as you said, that this is a Truro painting, because why would you call something that is nowhere near Truro to be Truro? But, you know, that's, that's the way the railroad ran, and that's what it was called. And I, um, and there's also an image of the, ho the original house in which uh, this was based on that, that is in the exhibition, so you can see what he was dealing with and how he changed it. I... Um, the paintings that I decided to put with them were, were another way of trying to describe how Hopper painted. Because when he was in Truro, unlike when he was in New York, he used to do his work in plain air out in the open and, space. And just so we can orient people, Truro is on Cape Cod, right? Great Cape Cod, right. And so... Painting out in the open is different than doing multiple sketches till you get what you want. Now, Hopper was very comfortable with that area and knew it very well and just moved around it in order to find interesting subjects. But I paired two works with the same title, um, uh, and they are um, a, about a, a house that in which he stayed when he was first came down before he built his own. And one of them is a watercolor and one of them is an oil. And what I'm trying to show you is that Hopper wasn't always successful in his attempts to uh, make a composition. And I try to explain why the watercolor was abandoned and the oil was considered to be successful. And you can see it in the composition because the watercolor loses its, its, its ability to be dramatic. It, it, it's too, too, uh, too horizontal. The, the diagonals that he's so famous for in his compositions are lost in that. And then I take another painting, which is of the same uh, subject matter, only he concentrates solely on the roofs, which in a way is turning Hopper into a contemporary artist because he's looking at the geometry of the roofs rather than the actual uh, house and how it looked like. Though modern artists may claim that, artists have been dealing with geometry <laughs> since at least the Renaissance. I mean, you know, <laughs> there's nothing really new under the sun. But we call <laughs> contemporary things geometric compositions <laughs> as, if, as if nobody else did a geometric composition. So when did he start going to South Truro then? Uh, in, uh, in the late 20s, he, he was around that area. In 1930, he started to live down there in in the uh, in the house in, in in the house of the um, postmaster, and then he built his own house, and um, and would he just spend summers there? Is he that... spent his summers and close close to the fall uh -huh. every summer since from 1930 till his death. And our painting was done. 31, uh -huh. yeah. Most of them are labeled 30 to 33. That seemed to be a big time in which he did those landscapes. Uh -huh. No, he continued to do it. Oh, he did. Yeah. He did. He continued to do it. And, you know, most of those, although later on some of them started to become studio looking because he would put figures in them and he would, you know, uh, Cape Cod landscape and things like that. Um, but, the, but these usually did not have figures. Most of the ones that we think of as Truro paintings or Cape Cod paintings were landscapes. Are there drawings? Landscapes. 
that he did? There are no drawings for, for any of these that we know of. Uh -huh. So they were all painted out of doors then? Yeah, most of them were painted out of doors. Because typically an artist who paints out of doors does not make a preparatory sketch. Doesn't need to, no. Though he may have a sketchbook or something where he sort of yeah, wanders around have, and yeah. plots out places that he'd like to paint and sort of works out basic compositions before he starts to paint, but maybe he just carried his canvas around until he found something he liked to paint. And a lot of times, although the ones I have in there are two oils and a watercolor, a lot of his Truro and Cape Cod paintings were watercolors uh -huh. because the, the medium could travel well. You really didn't have to set it up. If it was raining, you could sit in the car and you could, you could paint. So, um, of course, I wouldn't want to rain, uh, paint with watercolor out in the rain, but it's all right. If you're in uh, the car, you're all right. If you're in the car, you're all right. So... <laughs> So anyway, I mean, I, I, think, um, I think his Truro paintings really show a different... That's why I like to pair them, and that's why the, the exhibition itself is almost divided by, by the colors we've chosen, because it's a whole different side of Hopper than you, would have, you see in his New York paintings. Loneliness and um, isolation still are a part of it, but it's not quite as obvious in a landscape as it is in, in the interior painting. Though, uh, as we discussed before, there are changes, at least in uh, our painting, uh, from actuality. I mean, the trees that he depicts don't exist. Is that correct? Well, the, tr the trees in the area of the house were burned down because I think there was some sort of insect or disease that was being spread by the trees, and so they were... They were um, destroyed. So he put them back in for compositional purposes and I mean I think it's a really nice addition. It's not quite as stark <clears throat> because you have those trees yeah, it is. between the railroad and the and the house. But the thing the thing that makes it let's say lonely is because you know you have a subject of the constant movement of American society. We're constantly on the move. And you can you can almost feel that the trees are blowing from the breeze that the train that just passed went by. There's also nobody. I think you've been looking at these paintings much too much. <laughs> I think I am totally hoppered out. <laughs> Let's get into a little bit of Hopper's personality. Okay? You go right I'll ahead. I'll go right ahead. I'll make it all up as I go along. Which is, you know, we understand Hopper's personality. We do from his friends. But a lot of Hopper's personality and how he, he acted or, you know, interacted with people is from his wife Joe's diaries, which can be fairly vicious when it comes to her husband. Both of them were artists when they fir first married. They, they went to the same uh, school together and they worked under uh, Robert Henry. Uh, he, was their, he was their mentor in their early years. And, um, but he never uh, supported her art. He never advocated what she did. If you, you know, he he really he really didn't appreciate anything that she did. So she held it against him most of her life and really uh, laid it out in the diaries. So sometimes, if you want to understand Hopper and you rely too much on the diaries, you're only getting one side. But if we look at those diaries and we also take into consideration what his friends said, he was very introspective himself. He read a lot. He went to the theater a lot. He was, you know, an advocate of going to movies, especially between the times that he painted. He would just, you know, look, sort of be sa saturate himself in movies. And um, he was an unfriendly sort, certainly not warm. Um, he was hard to talk to because he would sort of disappear in the middle of your conversation and not say anything, and people would be sitting and waiting well and nothing would happen so I think he wasn't extremely likable he was very very adamant on on not accepting awards sometimes or accepting them very cursely because he didn't like to talk so I wouldn't say he didn't have any friends who didn't get along with people but um he wouldn't wouldn't be someone that if you met on on the street or spent a little time with it maybe you'd want to spend a lot of time with well you know I think for many great artists I mean the the their work becomes sort of all-consuming, and, and so they, they may not be so socially adept. I suspect if you were a social butterfly, you might not be a great painter. I mean, it's, it's something that you're living in your own sort of cocoon, your own little world, and, and the, the, 
it exists on the canvas. And, and uh, you know, if you think of many of the great artists um, in history, they never married. I mean, they were so devoted to their artwork that, that they didn't have time for family or friends or, uh, I mean, it's, it, it, it's almost a mania. It becomes all consuming for a lot of artists. And, and I suspect there's a downside to that on the social front. And I think it was problematic being for him to be married. He married late in life in his 40s. He was sort of set in his ways. And um, Joe interfered with his lifestyle. But on the other hand... He wanted to paint. You wanted him to take out the trash, you know. Ooh, yeah. Sure. But from, from how, many store, how many steps up? 78 <laughs> steps from the bottom? He was not likely to take the trash out. But I think that despite the fact that that he resented her in some way because she was always trying to talk to him. She was extremely helpful in keeping reporters away from him, you know, uh, making sure his time was, you know, private for himself. When he painted, no one was allowed around him. She protected him, and she kept his records. And she, she actually kept his legacy. You know, it, it, it is what it is today a lot because of her. And, 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 of course, it's great work. There's nothing in that. But left to Hopper, it might have not been quite as obvious what he was doing. I think he struggled a lot with what he, was, what, would he, what he was trying to do. I think he would stand in front of blank canvases and think, you know, you, you ever think that a great artist thinks that he's never going to find another thing to paint? He's so used to painting. It's so many years that he's been doing it. Yet Joe would always say he would stand in front of a canvas and just angst over it. I mean, wh where is my next image going to come from? And can I, can I actually, you know, it's like getting an A in school on one, su in one subject and trying to keep on doing it. Can I keep, how long can I keep on doing it? And, uh, but he would say, once he got to the canvas, once he put the first thing on it, he was fine because that meant he had his idea and he could continue doing it. Now, is there a lot of evidence of him sort of constantly overpainting and oh. uh, you know, continuously sort of noodling with his canvases or once the idea was sort of, and the composition was fixed in the drawings, then he'd just go ahead and, and paint? Yeah, there's no indication that there's a lot of, there, in, in the hotel lobby, the, wom the, the younger woman, her head has been moved. But in anything else on the canvas, there is no indication that any changes have been made. Yeah, you work that out in the drawings, or at least if you're Edward Hopper, you do. And, yeah, and you work then... them out in, in the drawings, right. It's, it, it was just the, uh, that I think the girl's head was e either up, I think it was too low. I, I think he moved it up. Or well, that may be you know, partially due to his work in watercolor as well, because that's something you, yeah, can't, you can't change. change. I mean, right. once you, you know, put that pigment down on paper, it's, you know, you either have to keep going or throw it away. I mean, you can't overpaint, you can't scratch out, you can't really remove anything. So it's, it's very good training in a way it's like etching, um, where, where, you know, what, what you put down is final from the get-go. So. And remember, he started his career. As an he etcher. He got famous as an etcher. Right. And it was then when he really realized that's the first time he ever made any money is selling his etchings. It took him a long time, even when he was doing some great work, for him to sell even one work of art. But And then we have an etching in the exhibition, so you can see. That's related yeah, to the that's New that's related York, New to Haven, the New York, yeah. right. Uh, well, I think it was Degas who said, you know, let's make etchings because they'll teach us how to draw. And what that means is you just can't monkey with it once it's there. Right, and and right. so you just have to be very sure of yourself before you put that first mark on the etching plate. And and I'm sure that's very true. There are a lot, number of artists who have said that, that, that their work in printmaking really aided their drawing. Yeah, I, I, I think I think so. And I think... Uh, I think that was re that was really the first time that Hopper realized he had he he started his career as an illustrator illustrating he hated but he needed to make money it wasn't until he got into this etching field that he realized he could 
he could do this. And, you know, Hopper's one of those millions of artists who say they've never had any influence. But if you read the catalog, you realize that in our hotel lobby is Vermeer's influence and Degas' influence and Sloan's influence, uh, not to mention a general influence from Henry and the subject matter of the Ashcan School. So, um, you know, artists are trained, they read, they look. How could they not be influenced? I mean, it's just one of those things. But something about an artist that, if he admits he's had influence, then his art is an original. He's always afraid of losing himself mm -hmm. in someone else's art. And yet, on the other hand, you'd never confuse a Hopper painting never. with any of those others. So, whereas he's sort of a man of his time, and and is working within sort of a tradition that was existent. I mean, you could even talk about Hopper as a regionalist in a way, though we don't normally talk about East Coast regionalists. Regionalism is sort of a Midwest thing, but there is a certain similarity in a way with people like Grant Wood, for instance, and, and Hopper, I think. Um, so you're right. I mean, anybody who's looking at what's going on around them and associating with the artists around them that is going to pick up things. Uh, but yet the, the great artists like Hopper somehow distinguish themselves to the extent that, that their work is unmistakable. And that would be true with his etchings just as well as, as yeah, his paintings. Right, I mean, right. there's, you, and you'd think an etching, easily. I mean, it's just a, you know, almost like a pen and ink drawing uh, in, in look, but his, his etchings don't look like anybody else's either. No, you'd never confuse a no. Hopper anything with anybody right. else. And that's, see, this is, this is what makes Hopper so, uh, so much of a challenge because, well, he's just painting mundane subject, interiors, landscapes, everybody does that, you know, in a way. I mean, maybe not the type of subjects he did, but you know, they paint things. So what's the big deal about Hopper? But there's just something about the way he does things and the way he tries to create his scenes that just grabs you. Well, and he was popular in his own oh, lifetime. Oh, he was popular. I mean, he sold... A lot of artists were not, but he was. Yeah, like New York and New Haven, which we bought from him in 1930-something. Yeah. Some, yeah, right. Um, you know, and I... Uh, I'm sure lots of other museums were acquiring hoppers at the same time. Uh, and in a way, that's understandable because for American museums, his work was palatable. A lot of sort of incipient abstraction probably wasn't mm -hmm. for an institution that was conservative as ours was. Uh, but Hopper was you know, working in sort of a realist tradition, and, and that was perfectly acceptable. But the one thing I do find interesting about the drawings that you don't find in the paintings is that there's a certain exuberance in the drawings. You know, it, they're not finicky. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And obviously he never meant anybody to see those, but, you know, they were just for his own. But oftentimes a drawing will show another side of an artist's personality that you don't find in the paintings because the painting is sort of carefully wrought over time. A drawing is set down in a minute or two, and, and they're more almost like a manuscript, they're almost more like a letter from the artist to, to the, the viewer. So I'm always happy when drawings get paired with paintings because I think it's, they, they show a fuller picture of, of the artist than, than you'd get from the painting alone. They're, they're certainly not meticulous. The drawings are not, you know, uh, detailed and uh, overwrought. But you might, but the painting, although I wouldn't call it overwrought, is is detailed, but not detailed. I mean, it doesn't have little minor things sitting on the table or little tiny things around it. But in general, it looks more labored than the uh, sketches. Do. Well, and in comparison, I mean, you don't find that sort of bravura no, brush stroke that you, you find in William Merritt Chase but or you John think Singer that Sargent. That's what you're yeah. going to get right. when you look at the drawings, right. but you're surprised when you right. don't get it. And you know, the drawings even. Like the final um, painting is paired with a perspective drawing, which shows you that this, even everything else aside, one of the changes was in the perspective. Because each one of those figures or figure groupings is 
stands alone in its own perspective. The girl is uh, seen from above, bird's eye view. Uh, the couple is seen from a different view, and the and the and the uh, man behind the desk is straight on. So, and he opens it up so that you can see all these three people in those different perspectives as, as if you were looking through a camera or a convex mirror. It's all broadened out. It would never be able to be seen that way. In life. And then, you know, he, he's always considered that there's like a, a, like the, you're the voyeur because you're, you feel like you're intruding. But somehow here, you're more like maybe standing on the steps coming down in, in the hotel lobby or something like that. And the guy behind the, the, the clerk behind the desk is your voyeur, so in this particular painting. And another thing that's different about the painting is there's almost, well, there are no windows. Very rarely did Hopper do an interior that didn't have a windows. And I could say there's no obvious way out, although there, you know, there is a, a, a sunlight that comes in through, through the revolving door, it's not obvious. I mean, at first I thought that was a telephone booth, and I didn't know where. And that's another thing about Hopper. It's ho the light sources are not obvious. I mean, where's the light coming where the couple is? From something open overhead? Is it a fluorescent light? You know, you know the light that's coming in through the revolving door, but where, where's, the, where's the light? The girl, is she being lit from some other window that we don't see? The only, we know that there's a light behind the desk where the desk clerk is, so he's being lit, but what is he doing? Is he looking at the girl or looking at a piece of paper? His eye could be anywhere. I guess you'll have to read the catalog to find I out. I think I'll read the catalog <laughs> and I'll find out. <laughs> I wonder what the author thought. <laughs> See, even I, who have written it, <laughs> is still confused. There are always things to be discovered. And you know what? That is another thing about it. When I was writing the book, of course, I studied the painting really carefully and I studied the drawings. And I tried to pick up everything that I thought made a difference. And yet, I missed it. I missed it. The coat that Hopper's uh, man in the painting is carrying is something that I thought was like a barrier between his wife and himself. Just like I, comp I, pa I paired it in the book with the Degas that had a, the same barrier only using a table between two figures that were supposedly married. And then I find out from one of my docents, and bless the docents, I should have asked them to give me their opinion on the painting in the first place, that not only is the coat a barrier, but it's a connector. Because at the bottom of the coat, it, it connects to her dress. It's actually on top of her dress. So it's missing from the book, but if you're listening to this, you'll know that it is not only a barrier, but it's a connector. So it serves two purposes, which is the interesting thing about Hopper. I don't think there's anything in that painting, and I probably didn't get it all, that isn't absolutely necessary and doesn't make some statement. And that's why, even though I've written a book about it, someone else could write another one. Maybe not tomorrow. Hopefully not tomorrow. I don't want the competition. 